It's my assumption most people know the relationships of microorganisms, plants, and animals are more fragile than the roughly spherical space rock we call home. Nature made our home suitably self-sustaining. Millions of different species also share this planet. And yet, we are outliers. If you agree, then you agree the threats to our planet are more likely to come from within our own planet than from out there. In reference to out there, if we are alone, if a meteor was on a collision course with our home, we are the only beings with the technology to detect such an anomaly. But we are not truly alone in regards to the Earth. There was a time when the Earth wasn't like it is today. Still, sentient beings roamed every continent. They would gather resources in order to build their intricate homes. Faithful beings that fall in love with their partners for life. They forage the lands for food that nourish them, and by spreading their seeds and the seeds of the ones who nourish them, they conquered the land, they conquered the water, and they even conquered the sky. This is my story about the feather makers. These discarded treasures for decades, even centuries. To the strongest hurricane in 26 years. A taste for plastic. Hurricane Michael, 155 mile per hour winds, making landfall in Mexico. The eye has come ashore. The eye has come ashore. The eye has come ashore. Being a birder, well, there's really nothing to it. It's just showing your appreciation for a particular type of animal. In many cases, so much appreciation, you're willing to go out of your way to conserve and view and promote these types of animals. In many cases, you end up promoting many other plant and animal species in the process. I want to show you many things that I find amazing, and hopefully by the end of it, you'll see how they're all connected. Many times for a birder, it starts with seeing just one individual bird. That is called your spark bird, a bird that strikes your interest and makes you dive into the world of birds in general. This January, I saw it. At the time, I didn't know what it was. Pink, large like a flamingo, but different. It was two things at once, a rosy head spoonbill and my spark bird. No, unfortunately, I don't have a picture to share. But from that moment there, it all became clear. I scratched up some money and I invested. I bought a Canon Rebel EOS 6. I also got a 300 millimeter lens to go with it. Now I had hope. If I ever saw that bird again, I would have the photos to go with it. This camera gave me inspiration. I was a wildlife photographer on a mission. I wanted to do the same thing that Jack Black and Owen Wilson did. Drop the world and the stress that goes with it. Florida has 196 breeding species of birds. I made the financial commitment and the verbal commitment to y'all. Birds are like a puzzle. They puzzled me. I didn't realize how hard it would be to put together all the pieces. Want to attract birds to your garden? Then. Looking for birds just tied together a heck of a lot of totally different unrelated species. Here we are in Payne's Prairie. They reintroduced American bison. Over the last few decades, scientists estimated we lost half of the world's fertile topsoil because the migrating herds of megafauna dropped seeds and microorganisms, natural fertilizers mixed with the trampling and grazing that made the topsoil fertile and amazing. And many of the predators that made the herds migrate were eradicated from essential areas. This removed a natural biological control agent the predators. Many other herbivores like white-tailed deer and feral hogs became very prevalent and had no form of predation at all. There were no biological controls in place. No more wolves, no more bears, a reduction in wild cougars, the almost eradication of the Florida panther, gray foxes saw a decline, and the almost eradication of the bald eagle. All these factors led to a boom of the herbivores that remained and the big side effect over grazing. Many young saplings were ate before they ever had a chance to grow up to the canopy layer. This led to what I call the geriatric forest or very old forest with minimal new trees ever making it to the canopy layer. Flooding of Payne's Prairie from Hurricane Irma pushed back the encroaching hardwood forest creating a dead zone around the prairie. It was in this area I saw a large iconic pileated woodpecker. This is the largest North American woodpecker standing at 18 inches tall. But the American chestnut dependent and now extinct ivy billed woodpecker could have been up to 21 inches tall and unfortunately a tough lesson learned. The difference in the ivory billed and the pileated woodpecker is that the fats of the dependably late blooming American chestnuts is what allowed the ivory billed woodpeckers to thrive and overwinter. Whereas the pileated woodpecker primarily feeds on insects and about 60% of their diet is consistent of carpenter Fortunately, ants. Fortunately carpenter ants have a broad range of host plants. 
making the pileated woodpecker more resilient altogether. Every year when the waters in the Gulf of Mexico drop below 68 degrees, manatees swim through little tributaries into the artisan springs found here in Florida. These tributaries are essential for the manatee's survival because contrary to what you might actually think, manatees have very little fat and depend on the springs for warmth, which is a good example of why you should never judge a book by its cover. With my new camera, my understanding of Instagram and how I can share my photos with many new people, I frequently post wildlife photos there. Silver Springs, a once booming theme park, actually the first roadside attraction ever. After several incidents, the park closed down and the state reopened it. They removed all of the theme park-like attractions. I wanted to see how non-native macaques were thriving in this unfamiliar environment. While there, I spotted many lifers, the wood duck, the green heron, and I had a good enough camera to prove it, sort of. It's almost like in a building, an abandoned area. I saw the abundance of wildlife you would only expect at a pristine, human-free place, showing how important these protected springs actually are to all forms of wildlife, not just the manatees. This could be my chance to finally catch a snowy egret. All I've caught the great egret. I had a bucket list of this birds. The at the top of that for me was the bald eagle. How could the top get any better than that? An American icon. A raptor that could have easily gone extinct. If us people did nothing to stop the toxic DDT that causes eggshell thinning. The eggs were so thin the weight of a bird cracked it. Among the developing urban sprawl in my county, I frequently visited the same ponds, including the pond I saw my first spark bird. I found a few natural areas. I saw a lot of other birds that frequented these areas, and I did see a red shoulder hawk that was very vocal. But most importantly to me, I saw that throughout the year the same birds were present. This was eye-opening for me. I realized they were residents of these ponds, and that the birds lived, ate, and even bred in the very same pond. The birds adapted and found enough resources to survive in these locations. Sometimes there's so much wildlife clinging to these ponds that you don't see them all at first. But more times than not, they're looking right at you. Seeing the abundance of life a pond can sustain, it became a growing ache in my soul to enhance the pond in my own yard. While I hadn't established a population of tree frogs yet, mysteriously, two bullfrogs showed up. I can't even think of the closest body of water from my yard. It really motivated me to enhance the pond in my yard. While many people would think ponds are expensive, I beg to differ. The original pond liner I got only cost me $30 at a garage sale. Then my brother gave me a water trough, so I designed a creek that would flow between both bodies of water. Narrow on both ends with a pool in the, the middle. The shallows would create the perfect environment for tadpoles. And with another $10 in concrete, I fabricated a creek with two bodies of water. I found some local limestone and bought a $50 water pump. I circulated water from the bottom pond all the way down the waterfall, through the second reservoir, down the creek, into the main hall. I added a PVC pipe that had a slow trickle, ensuring this pond would always stay full. So for less than $200, I had the foundation to create a little micro-ecosystem. I grew plants from donated bulbs like lilies, as well as forage from many natives like red maple, beauty berries, coonties, elephant ears, and reeds and grass. I added some native water lilies and a few water hyacinths to create cover over the pond. It wasn't long before I saw the native minnow species reproducing, and eventually even dragonfly larvae. Then I heard a giant southern toad in my pond. And just a few weeks later, I saw tadpoles. Now large swarms of dragonflies fly around my house. I actually captured a photo of a dragonfly being ate by a robber fly. Robber flies are some bad bitches, but in a good way, of course. That's just a small scale of what I was talking about with biological controls being sure that certain species don't get out of control. These apex insect predators keep our ecosystem in balance. It didn't take long before birds of all sorts visited this little oasis in the yard that previously was a virtual desert. It's funny, when I first started my bird journey, every brown colored hawk was a red-tailed hawk. With my new camera and this photograph of the hawk, I did a little more research and realized that this was actually a red shoulder hawk. Don't judge me. I didn't have any people that were even interested in birds around me. I was uneducated that this was a red shoulder hawk, and I'd never even heard of a broad-winged hawk. They were all raptors, I guess. I put some bird feeders out to see what all birds might actually visit them. I mean, I've been photographing for a while and still hadn't seen a cardinal. So I was sure to put some sunflower seeds in the feeders because I had to capture a photo of the northern cardinal. It's probably one of the most recognizable birds in North America. I was a little scared. I remember seeing so many in the past. I would watch the feeders quite often. I remember seeing tons of goldfinches, a bird I didn't even know there was. 
being a new birder, I even captured some photos of them visiting my pond. Then suddenly, they were all gone. One day when I was working near my feeders in my car, I heard a squabble. I quickly turned and saw a raptor. I thought a falcon in my head. Quickly ran for my camera. When I pulled it out, the raptor was gone so quick. Right over here, I just recently had a sighting. Dang, this. I lost it. An opportunity for me as a new birder. The photographs are so important to me because I would use them to verify their identity in my ornithology book. Then I remembered I'd installed security cameras around my house. I know, scary, right? This is what I captured. I have eight cameras around my house. This seemed to be the best angle where I could actually see the bird fly in. I was standing by my truck, actually building a mailbox because the mail lady kept saying it was too low and too flimsy. The bird flew in so fast. Let me slow the camera down so you can actually see it for the one frame that it actually appeared. Focused on constructing the mailbox and unaware of what was flying in right beside me, for one frame you can see it. I heard the squabble. Other birds had alerted to the raptor's presence. I glanced at it, saw what it was, and quickly went into my truck to get my camera. And before I even had time, that bird was gone like the wind. But as time went on, I realized there were so many raptors. I'd seen swallowtail kites in the past. They came around when it was breeding season, and it got a little bit warmer here in Florida. Their V-tail is unmistakable. I was so fortunate to see three at one time in this birding trip. It was a highlight for me. I remember hearing in the past that you're supposed to report your sightings. Turns out, Florida is a crucial breeding ground for these amazing birds. I was used to seeing raptors at this point. I had even captured several photos of raptors eating different prey items. But most frequently, I captured the red shoulder hawks with various prey. Their excellent eyesight makes them quite the apex predators, eating a lizard. Here's one eating a katydid or a large green leaf mimicking insect. But it basically blew my mind when I captured this video of once doing a squirrel. Warning, viewer discretion is advised. Stand there and hold it it's dead. Dude, that is crazy. Right next to us. Yeah. Dude, we've been followed by hogs. This was the largest prey item I'd ever seen a bird eat, and I've seen lots of birds eating. This osprey or seahawk caught a mullet. This snowy egret caught a catfish. With those spines, it kind of freaks me out. This grebe dives to the bottom of the river and pulls up a crayfish, not once, but in two different situations. Birds are so well adapted, they pretty much have found ways to thrive in almost every situation and environment. I knew owls hunted at night, or let's say, I knew owls have great night vision, but I didn't know owls ate fish. This owl had ate a huge brim, eating it head first. It's almost like they put these animals out of their misery before they eat them. I guess that's just the way nature is. They actually are compassionate. I actually saw several owls over the course of a year. But I'd always seen just one species, the barred owl. Turns out there are several species of owls here in Florida. One day, or should I say one evening, I got lucky. I spotted something perched on a guy wire to a cell phone tower. I had a hunch it was an owl, so I broke out the camera and clicked. I had the blurriest photo in my arsenal. I spotted a long-eared owl. Luckily, the video was slightly more detailed. I was crossing my yard and a large grasshopper flew up as I walked past. I watched it fly by and whoosh! A raptor flew right over my shoulder and caught this grasshopper. It flew over to the nearest tall tree. This was the first good view I got of the four raptors that had been around my yard for the last couple weeks. It was a new species for me. I'd captured photos of them at a distance, but this grasshopper sacrifice led me to capturing another raptor from doing a prey item. Finally, a good enough photo I could refer to my ornithology book for identification and the confirmation I needed. This was a Mississippi kite. I had good photos of swallowtail kites and now Mississippi kites. Examining this photo made me feel fairly certain this was the bird that swooped down into my bird feeder to prey on another smaller bird for my surveillance footage. I had a problem keeping track of the birds I spotted. Many birders have a number. That number represents either the number of species of birds you've seen, but technically the big year means how many species of birds you spotted in one year. For me, it was a little different. My big year has definitely morphed into how many bird species I can photograph. I wasn't really good enough at ID to separate these birds, especially at just a glance. Truthfully, I would have thought they were all goldfinches. 
You never know when you just won't see a bird ever again. And like the person who took this black and white photo of the ivory billed woodpecker, it could be the absolute last known photo or footage that exists. Finally, I was building some confidence in capturing good photos of a northern cardinal. I didn't really see any for the big portion of the year. I was wondering if it migrated like flocks of American robins that came through every year. They would come through in massive congregations and cover my whole field, which reminds me of a story I heard about another now extinct bird, the passenger pigeon. But cardinals are actually year-round residents. They will set up a nest in the area they know they have the resources they need, like food, water, and safety, of course. The right combination to fulfill their life's purpose, to reproduce. They need a bush or a tree that has tight branches so they can set up a nest. I was lucky the bushes I planted two years earlier were suitable branching arrangements for these cardinals to build a nest. Now you will see these cardinals in my yard year round. It's crazy to think how true it is that one seed can make a difference. This loquat tree has been the host to so many birds over the last year. In my opinion, the coolest thing I saw was a flock of cedar waxwings. These birds are so beautiful. Their feathers are so perfect. I can see why they're called waxwings. Most of us have heard of the canary in the coal mine, but the reason the canary was in the coal mine is because it was far more susceptible to environmental factors than us humans. On a large scale, birds are the canaries and earth is the coal mine. Take the bald eagle for instance. I can count on my two hands every single sighting I've seen of a bald eagle. It was this footage I captured last year that made me realize I needed a better camera. Since seeing this bald eagle and seeing my spark bird, I've captured three out of five bald eagle sightings. I didn't capture footage on one of those occasions because the bird was perched in the same spot two days in a row. But the camera allowed me to get this footage of a bald eagle perched on a dead tree. One day while driving, I saw a bald eagle perched on a power line pole. So I quickly grabbed my camera and snapped it all out of focus. I was tired of missing opportunities. I missed the opportunity to capture the roseate spoonbill. I've never seen a passenger pigeon, I'll never see a passenger pigeon, or an ivory-billed woodpecker. I was snapping so many bird photographs it was hard to keep track of which birds I actually spotted. So I got a list of all the known birds that have been seen here in Florida. I can scratch this one off right here. But I need a better organization technique so I got this photo album. So I could organize my photos, see roughly what the environment the bird was in, and I could easily access them to show other people different bird species. I could easily change out the photos as I got better ones, and now I can keep track of them. I could put my best photos on display. I realize how important biodiversity really is. Biodiversity is an opportunity for many, many plants, for insects and birds to choose from. and many insects for birds and, well, insects to choose from. A lack of biodiversity is what leads to catastrophic disasters like the extinction of the ivory-billed woodpecker. Diversity is why the pileated woodpecker is still around. I don't only want to speak in the past, the problem still exists. For instance, many species are completely dependent on another species, like in the case of the monarch butterfly and the milkweed it co-evolved with. If for some reason we lose the milkweed, like we lost the American chestnut tree, then we will lose the monarchs just like we lost the ivory-billed woodpeckers. I felt so fortunate to be able to see the pileated woodpeckers. I would say this is an uphill battle, but it's not a battle we can afford to lose. I want to leave you with one question. Where do we get our food? Our clothes? Our shelter? Our houses? Everything we need to survive. If you said nature, you'd be right. If you said humans, you'd also be right because us humans are part of nature. We have to rewild the damaged ecosystems in order to protect the biodiversity that remains. If you live in the Southeast United States, go out and plant a firecracker bush. You may get hummingbirds or clouded yellow. Plant some milkweed, you may get monarchs. Build a pond, it's not as expensive as it sounds. You may end up with robber flies feeding on swarms of dragons that fill your air. Protect the springs by cleaning up plastics every time you see one. Because you never know when you may not see a cardinal for half the year. Plant a bush and that cardinal may just build a nest. But the key is, these resources are there when these co-inhabitants of our planet need them. Share your stories down in the comments. That actually helps quite a bit. Hit the like button, subscribe, select all notifications. It really helps out a lot. See a little head pops off like a little bird. And those are the seconds and the moments I'm looking forward to. Catch that little bird.
that maybe I haven't seen before. Maybe that isn't seen that often. So I just sit here and I wait for that little bird to pop up right over the horizon. Overall, I'd say it was a pretty good year.